Anthony Hopkins Academy Award winning portrayal of Dr. Lecter in Jonathan Demme's The Silence of the Lambs. Declared best picture for that year, the film established itself as a classic of the horror and suspense genres. You might even be familiar with the other films about Dr. Lecter or even the original novels by Thomas Harris. In case you aren't familiar with why Hannibal sends shivers up so many spines, let me clarify. He is not only a serial killer, but also a cannibal. What makes this Hannibal Lecter different from any of the others? This Hannibal is a free man. He wears a button-up shirt, not a straight jacket. His mouth is visible, not covered by a muzzle. This Hannibal's murderousness is unknown to those around him in the beginning of the series. Brian Fuller's NBC television adaptation is the only one created to date but follows a long cultural awareness of the serial killing Hannibal character created by author Thomas Harris in his 1981 novel, Red Dragon. Unlike most of the other Hannibals on screen, this Hannibal has yet to be discovered. This Hannibal is in his prime before his imprisonment, free to walk the streets of his adopted hometown of Baltimore. This is Hannibal Lecter making dinner. In fact, Hannibal's ability to cook freely is exactly what makes him both different and dangerous. Brian Fuller establishes a different kind of fear when he depicts Hannibal in this way. The show draws parallels between the horror genres, crime shows like CSI, Law and Order, and of course, cooking shows. Building on American media's obsession with food, nutrition, excess, and consumption, Fuller constructs a new genre, food horror. The viewer expects a crime horror show, complete with disturbing crime scenes hearkening back to the original films. The violence on Hannibal isn't bound to just these crime scenes. It blooms beyond the body's placement and flowers in Hannibal's kitchen. The reason that this disturbs so heavily is because the kitchen is a place of familiarity and comfort as depicted in TV cooking shows. The show does consistently deliver on its promise of horrific crime scenes, though frequent cooking scenes that are visually enrapturing and mouthwatering are no less central to the show's aesthetic identity. Food horror is informed by shows that revel in excess, like Man vs. Food, YouTube's Epic Mealtime, and cooking how-to shows like America's Test Kitchen. These kinds of shows form the template for how Fuller's Hannibal demonstrates Hannibal's sense of superior taste, refinement, and skill. This refinement is also reflected in his choice of acquaintance. All facets of Hannibal's personal life revolve around whether he chooses to invite one for a meal. Hannibal's taste is what matters. Both friends and enemies are invited to a meal, though enemies may find themselves on the menu. What the viewer quickly learns is that every graceful slice, every swift chop, and every single cut and pan is possibly a human leg, heart, or liver. Through these sequences, the show confuses our perception of the food we desire, pushing us toward the realization that we are both drawn to and repulsed by what this charismatic cannibal eats. The reality of Hannibal within the context of crime and cooking shows is that most of his murders occur off screen and the majority of his violent nature is demonstrated through his psychological manipulation and superior cooking skills. Hannibal does not need to show that he is a master of combat because the viewer can see the evidence every time he cooks. <laughs> Hannibal is the chef of nightmares and we are his obedient guests. In order to place Hannibal's cooking within our contemporary food and TV culture, the creators of Hannibal borrow from the TV sets of cooking programs. On the right is one example of what a reality TV cooking show set looks like. Channels like the Food Network visually establish these kitchens as part of the idealized home aesthetic. There are fake windows, an appealing color scheme, and a lot of expensive appliances and tools to convince the viewer that this is how great food is made. These kitchens imply that both real culinary skill is a result of expensive gadgets and also roots this presumed skill in a celebrity and reality TV culture. 
a great chef in DC can become a famous great chef nationally if he appears on, say, Iron Chef America and meets celebrity chef Bobby Flay. The kitchen becomes more than a place to make food. It is a place where culinary dreams are cooked up and catchphrases aren't a gimmick so much as the norm. <coughs> TV kitchens have perfected the art of food style. Restaurants also establish stylized artificial environments in order to set expectations for the food that will be eaten. In the same way that chefs must develop unique and tasty menus, the restaurant dining room must also have a visual style of its own. Think of restaurant reviews. Buzzwords like inviting or warm are often used for family-friendly and relaxed dining, while more upscale businesses receive professional terms. These sorts of environments, both in person and on screen set our expectations for what patrons might experience when they eat. As a result, we expect food shows to be bright, warm, and inviting, even when they're competitive. When we see Hannibal's Kitchen, we do not make these same positive associations. Even without the prior knowledge of Hannibal's food habits, we are pushed away from our comfortable TV kitchens and into something colder. Few of the other Hannibal adaptations focus on the kitchen as a setting, let alone the cooking. Brian Fuller's adaptation is a prequel. The events of his show, which takes its title from the main character, happened before his eventual capture by the FBI and subsequent prison sentencing for his crimes. As a result, Hannibal has the freedom to explore his diet as he pleases, while practicing psychiatry in his office. His well-established psychiatric practice affords Hannibal a lavish dining room and a kitchen in his home, as well as his own office. This space enables his horrific crimes, which range from drugging his patients to murdering and eventually cannibalizing them. Therefore, Brian Fuller's puppetry behind the scenes as the showrunner is one of the most important elements of the show. Not only does Fuller select the overarching story for each season, but he also develops and plots important sequences, especially the food scenes. He both formally and informally invites a conversation between the viewer, the creator, and the show itself. Fuller's primary and formal method of inviting conversation comes online through social media, especially Twitter and his own website, which allows readers to access behind the scenes photographs and full scripts of every episode for free. Indeed, someone has to design every single element of what we see on screen, and it must be filmed to disguise the artificial nature of the set, just the same as in any sitcom or fictional show. In an interview with the Los Angeles Times, the production designer, Patty Podesta, cites several painters, including Gerard Richter, Francis Bacon, and Edward Hopper as influences on the production design of the show. Though Podesta doesn't cite specific pieces, the director of photography, James Hawkinson, mentions Caravaggio's The Taking of Christ as an influence on the show's overall look. The food, like the set, must also be designed. Hannibal's food looks otherworldly at times and is often shot in chiaroscuro. As a result, the food's most bizarre qualities are accentuated by the limited lighting. The viewer's want of what the food is made of is just as pressing of a need as our desire to look away and suppress our appetites. This aesthetic grants the images of the food with the same sort of gravitas that we associate with the old master paintings and also obscures the reality of the food that Hannibal cooks and eats. The props are equally specific. In an episode from the second season called Foodamono, we are shown Hannibal flipping through a Rolodex. We are shown recipe cards with stick-on corners where a business card of Hannibal's intended entree sits. Each recipe features ingredients on the front side and cooking directions on the back. Then he chooses his ingredients, his hands manipulating the meat, slicing it from the bone, and cooking it with clear skill. The only ingredients one feels safe drooling over are the vegetables, and even then, the question of whether or not they might be human remains. These recipes do not just produce delicious meals. They are the result of a calculated exercise in torture, dismemberment, and the culinary arts. Brian Fuller realized an opportunity to reach out to a real-life chef. Jose Andres, the Spanish chef who popularized tapas across the US and especially in Washington, DC, and who is associated with molecular gastronomy. 
His expertise in the latter made him the perfect choice to determine how to break expectations of what food could be visually while still tasting excellent. Chef Andres was actually the same chef who beat Bobby Flay on Iron Chef America and has since appeared on a number of talk shows from Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations to The Ellen DeGeneres Show. By asking a celebrity chef for guidance in illustrating Hannibal's palate, Fuller appeals to the viewer's sense of disgust at Hannibal's food and also appeals to our sense of curiosity. Is the food real and edible? Would I eat something if it looked like that? Could I make that at home? The answer is potentially yes. Fuller also hired a food stylist named Janice Poon. The food stylist's job overall is to make the food look believable on screen whether it's for a commercial, a cooking program, or a scripted show. Chef Andres works in conjunction with Janice Poon to design a set of dishes that would be in line with the refined palate of Chef Hannibal. As a result, the food is not only edible, it is also meticulously planned to fit the charismatic, aesthetically obsessed Hannibal. At the same time, the food looks slightly off, just the same way the viewer sees Hannibal himself on screen. Hannibal gets away with his eccentric taste for a long time during the plotting of the show. Despite his little jokes about food, eating, and even cannibalism, his friends and co-workers continually excuse Hannibal. They have come under his spell, intrigued by the charismatic man who frequently offers elaborate meals that he makes himself. He seems selfless to the naive, sociable to the FBI, and odd to the perceptive, but usually escapes or murders before they figure out his secret. Hannibal's entire lifestyle depends on his ability to analyze, perceive, manipulate, torture, murder, and consume those around him. It is as though he's tenderizing the meat. It's no coincidence that Janice Poon's food styling has received a tremendous amount of positive attention since the show began, to the, show, to the point where she started adding the recipes that she created for each dish on Hannibal to her own website for her food art. This site chronicles every single episode's food and her story of how the production for the dish came to be. Often she writes of late night phone conversations and last minute script changes, which are often par for the course of a television show production. Her blog gives tremendous insight to what makes TV shows happen and how. Most of the dishes are pre-planned to fit the script but often changes in budget, time constraints, and fresh ideas will change the final product. Janice Poon mocks up sketches of what a dish looks like in its preliminary stages. Cannibalism is what Hannibal is best known for, but the psychological torture he carries out first is equally central to the show. This torture is most evident in the dinners that he holds for his guests. Hannibal follows a strict set of laws that he does not establish for any other characters on the show until he is seducing them. The catalyst for their death is often their misbehavior or his interpretation of bad manners. In Hannibal's own words, whenever feasible, one should always eat the root. So what makes these weird looking dishes so appealing to Hannibal's guests? It's as though they're seeing something entirely different from what is shown on screen at times and at other times the food actually looks appealing enough to want. Some viewers have taken this want to the next level through Janice Poon's blog. Not only does she post simplified recipes, but she also encourages the show's fans, known by, known by their nicknames, Fanables, to send in their versions. Janice Poon's book, Feeding Hannibal, a connoisseur's cookbook, comes out in the fall. The majority of the episodes deal directly with food in their titles. Kunamono, amuse-bouche, entree, aperitif, and antipasto, to name a few. Scholar Michael Fuchs explains that the episode titles in the first season of Hannibal are taken from, th from a 13 course menu of classic French cuisine, a menu with the same sort of rigorous structure as Hannibal's ritualistic murders and the show's overall narrative. Hannibal is an artist with few boundaries and a brutal idea of mixed media. The viewer, uncomfortably positioned between awe and fear, consciously becomes a part of the grip of the show itself. The gore of the murder scene evokes a reaction and our curiosity is activated. What is Hannibal making for dinner tonight? Hannibal causes us to associate death with dining, just as its cannibal, ant cannibal antagonist does. Fuller himself has
has even changed his own eating habits as a result of the show. He's now a pescatarian and has even produced an advertisement for the animal rights group PETA in the style of Hannibal. Also, the De Laurentiis family, who coincidentally are the relatives of TV chef Giada De Laurentiis, produced several of the films in the Hannibal franchise as well as the show. NBC's Hannibal has carved out a niche for itself. It is a feat that few other shows can boast. Media has been consistently used as a tool for both positive and negative outcomes, and Hannibal asks us all to re-examine our relationships with food. What does it mean that a show about a cannibal's culinary preferences is getting its own widely printed cookbook? Hannibal makes manifest the deepest horrors we have within our culturally constructed dream of food. <laughs>